And joining us right now on the Rough and Northern Phoenix guest line, our good friend from Q&A Podcast as part of the Inside the Birds Empire, Quentin Michael joins us. What's going on there, Q? Hey, what's up, man? Glad to have uh, glad to be on the show. Great to have you back. Really appreciate it. Uh, you turned a lot of heads the last time you were on, uh, about a month and a half ago, so I appreciate you jumping on now. At the end of the season, just now, I know you discussed it a lot with your partner in crime, Jason Avant, Q&A show. People need to check out that podcast whenever they can. Uh, but you guys jumped into this a lot throughout the season, a lot about the Eagles' defense, obviously, and a lot about the Eagles' offense. Most notably, the first thing I want to ask you about is just this team as a whole. What can I ask you? Like, What, what surprised you the most about how this team played this football season? I think the biggest surprise um, was actually that they made it to the playoffs. I think early on, um, especially after the, you know, the, the midpoint, after the second, second game to about the sixth, seventh game, um, it, it wasn't looking good. It wasn't good at all. It was, it was, it was pretty bad. So the fact that they were able to string, string some wins together, um, kind of figure out what they do well and then make it into the playoffs to me was, was the, the total success for the entire team. Mm-hmm. I, I know people will look at it and say, it's a young team, just get them the experience no matter what, how beneficial is that experience to a young team? I think it's huge. I think it's, it's, it's very beneficial, especially, you know, on a day like today where, you know, season's over, you, you're playing, um, you know, last week and then just now, boom, it's over. And so I think that that really starts to hit home, especially when you're a young player. You, you always you always have this mindset, oh, you know, we can keep going or we got next year. But truth is, every every year is a different year. There's going to be a lot of people on this team that aren't going to be back with the team next year. And so, you know, you start to learn really quickly how, how quick things can change. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to ask you about the defensive coordinator, Jonathan Gannon, already getting a lot of uh, interest. Now three job interviews he's supposed to go on to be the head coach of maybe the Texans, maybe the Vikings, and then maybe the Denver Broncos. Is this a surprise to you that Jonathan Gannon is getting this much attention already as a head coach after one year as a D.C.? Um, it's a little bit surprising, but, you know, every every NFL team right now, they're trying to find the next Sean McVay. They're trying to find the next, you know, young, uh, creative mind. And, um, you know, barring what, what happened this season, um, I, I, I personally don't think um, his resume is, is there yet. Um, after seeing, you know, the, the, after all the criticism he's taken for his, his play calling, um, for me personally, it, it just wasn't my cup of tea. So um, I, I think it's normal. I think it's, it's kind of what the league is right now. You know, everybody's trying to find the next quarterback, the next Kyler Murray or, or whoever. And so, you know, these, these owners are taking a chance on a guy that may or may not be ready yet. Mm-hmm. When you and I last talked about Jonathan Gannon, one of the things you talked about was how after the Chargers game, which is when we uh, last spoke, uh, he blitzed more than he ever had the entire season to that point. He blitzed uh, Justin Herbert more than he had any quarterback throughout the season. And then he blitzed a little bit more. But when you and I talked about it, you said, eh, they're kind of blitzes because they're either rushing four or five, but that's not really a blitz to me. When you play for a guy like uh, you know Jim Johnson, it's not really a blitz to you. What did you make of how he did the second half of the season as defensive coordinator? I think, I think as a whole, I think he did, he did get better. Um, I still think, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm really frustrated with, with uh, last night's game. Um, I think he kind of re- regressed. And I think, especially in that first, that first quarter, um, it, it felt like he was afraid to, to, to get after Brady a little bit. And you can't go against, you know, a guy like Brady and spot him 17 points, um, which, you know, they did and, and playing soft earlier in the game. Um, he, they kind of picked it up towards the end. He started changing up the coverages. You know, the front four started to get there. Um, but I think up until yesterday, I think he was progressing really nicely um, and doing some really cool things. But I just feel like maybe maybe at the beginning of the game, maybe he's a little bit too worried about Tom and, and his IQ, his football IQ. All right. Uh, so let me, let's jump into that for a second. So just with Nick Sirianni, how would you feel if your head coach made the call? So to get away from Jonathan Gannon for a second. How would you feel if your head coach made the call? Hey, defense, you're going to be on the field first against Tom Brady. We're going to defer to the second half offensively, and you guys go out there first and have at it. Well, what would your attitude be? I love, I love going on defense first. I, oh wow, personally, okay. you know, because I, I feel like oftentimes that first, um, that first uh, drive, that first offensive drive is always kind of overrated. I'd rather, as a as a player and as a coach, I'd rather have um, you know the ball start the second half. Um, that first drive is usually um, you, you're going to get the first 15. They're going to scheme you up pretty good defensively, but um, in long in the long stretch of the game, I don't think I think just, I just think that first job is overrated. Overrated. Oh. So all right, my, my I mean my take on it, uh, and again I always joke about this with you. Uh, 11, 11 years NFL experience, 
freshman football to Archbishop Wood in the suburbs of Philadelphia. <laughs> anyway, so uh, I, when I look at it, I just go, man, I didn't want any piece of Tom Brady to start out that game. I wanted the run defense or I wanted the running offense on the field trying to establish uh, a little bit of momentum early and not give the first crack to Brady. Do you see that side of the argument at all? Or do you just think, no, the, the best bet every time is to defer to the second half? Yeah, I mean, I, I see that side of it. Um, but to me, you know, if the first 15 is the first 15. They're going to scheme you up pretty good. So whether he got the ball first or whether he got the ball, you know, after an offensive drive, he's still going to have his, his, his plays. So um, I, I personally would have wanted to be on the field first as a defender. Um, you know, if they come out that game and they're, they're hitting Brady early, if they get a, a three and out in the first drive, then, you know, set you up. And it, it gets the mindset of the, the entire team kind of, uh, you know, focused and ready to go. So um, I actually don't fault going, you know, on, on defense first. All right. Uh, when it comes to the three first round draft picks and all that, how many of those do you want to see help the defensive side of the ball? All of them. <laughs> <laughs> All of them. I didn't you know, think I, you. Would, I didn't think you were going to say anything else. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, wishful thinking. Um, you know, I, we need we need some help at safety. We need a cornerback. Um, defensive end is a huge huge need. Um, you know, and and I wouldn't even mind a linebacker. I know they're never going to do it. Wishful thinking, but um, you know, I think those three picks need to all go on the defensive side of the ball to kind of revamp and. The way the, the way the game is now, you just you just have to have playmakers on defense. You have to have guys that can run and hit, and um, you know it's it's just a very important part of the game nowadays. Uh, uh, speaking of those picks, a lot of people are asking whether or not the Eagles should use those three picks, a couple of those first uh, three uh, first uh, first round picks there to trade for a quarterback, whether that be Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson down the line, whether they need to draft a quarterback in the first uh, first round. Where are you right now? on the status of Jalen Hurts as the Eagles quarterback? Is he the quarterback of the future as a franchise guy? Is he the guy going into next year? Or are you already looking for somebody else to be the Eagles signal caller? Yeah, I, I have a feeling that um, that he he may not be the starting quarterback next year. I think he's on track. I think he's showing some good things. Now, I think yesterday he kind of digressed again. I think I, I actually think that the Eagles not playing their starters against Dallas really kind of hurt this team. I think if they would have went back, you know, do it all over again, they would have had those starters in for the first quarter just to kind of keep them from getting rusty. I, I felt like the team came out yesterday, especially on offense, really rusty. Um, so anyway, barring what I saw yesterday, I still think he's a quarterback of the future. But now let's, you know, Deshaun Watson, um, Russell Wilson, um, uh, Aaron Rodgers are Aaron all Rogers. clearly, clearly, um, you know, ready to, to step in. So. If the Eagles do make a move, I understand that. If they make a move, trade one of those those picks or all those picks for a guy like Rodgers or, you know, Russell Wilson, then you instantly upgrade your team. So yeah. I think um, I'm okay if, if if you go out and get any of those quarterbacks, but I, I don't think – I don't see any quarterback coming into the draft next year that's going to be better than than um, Jalen Hurts personally. Gotcha. Um, to go back to that for a second there, uh, when it comes to uh, Jalen Hurts, what have you seen him get better at as the season has gone on? I think, you know, again, it's hard because last week or last night, I think he, you know, digressed really far. But mm -hmm. up until now, I think he was seeing the field much better. Um, he was having more confidence in his throw. He was having more confidence in his arm. I mean, he always moved around the pocket well. Um, early in the season, whenever he would get any kind of flash or any kind of pressure, he would just take off. And we started to see him, um, you know, step up into the pocket, climb up into the pocket and find open guys on the field. Um, and so I, I think – that progression was there. I think last night, um, for whatever reason, he just it just he just wasn't seeing the field. Um, maybe he was overthinking it. I saw you know three or four plays where you had you know Devontae Smith wide open. You had guys wide open all over. Quez Watkins, yeah, yeah, Quez, and just not finding them. So it was really frustrating seeing that. Uh, now this is interesting because you played for the 2010 Eagles uh, in that year of Michael Vick in the Joe Webb game. When we say wow. Joe Webb, like. As <laughs> You just answered my question. I was going to say, when when we hear Joe Webb as fans, we go, oh, God, you were in the game. When you think of that Tuesday night game that got pushed back because of snow, uh, what do you think when you hear the words Joe Webb? Uh, instant instant pain. <laughs> that, that, that game, I, I, still cannot, I still cannot explain or understand what happened in that game. I mean, game planning all week, you plan for one guy and then, you know, you, you, you see a different guy running quarterback. And I think that kind of threw us off the Tuesday night, the snow, I think everything just kind of was off in that game. And, um, you know, 
I, I honestly, if we could go back in that game, I, that's probably the one game where I would like to go back and and, and replay that one because, you know, it was it will hurts. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, I, I just to tell you this, I worked for the Sunday night crew uh, that game. I worked 11 years on Sunday night football, and that was a Sunday night game that was moved to Tuesday, as you well know. So mm-hmm. I'm in the truck, toasty warm, by the way, I might add. But anyway, I'm in the truck, and we all have our allegiances. Like every everybody that works for Sunday night football is a football fan. I mean, they travel around to watch football. You better like the sport. So throughout that game, I just have I just remember my friends turning around and looking at me and be like, what's with your Eagles, Farzetta? And I'm like, I got nothing. I don't know. It's a Tuesday <laughs> night. I wish I could explain this. So I, I know if you didn't couldn't explain it, I know I still can't explain it. Um, but as far as the starters play, now you mentioned this week 18. I wanted to see Jalen Hurts and at least a handful of the starters out there actually playing uh, maybe a quarter maybe even a few series just to get something going because they hadn't scored any points other than three points they scored in uh, the four games in the first quarter that they had with Jalen Hurts as their starting quarterback as the season started to wind down. They averaged five points in the first half of all those games, all four games. So you're more of the school starters should play, try to get something going so they have a little bit of momentum going into the playoffs? Absolutely. I think that's huge, especially when you have a young team like this. Um, you know, I kind of saw it in the Dallas game. I kind of saw, you know, watching the players on the sideline and, you know, I w- just the, it just didn't, didn't seem like the focus was there during that Dallas game. And so I think the mindset, I think the mindset of a player when those things kind of happen is you when you're playing in a game like that, even though it's in your mind, you didn't need the game. You're sending a message to your team that it's still important. You're sending a message to your team that we still need to go out there and perform. And mm-hmm. so when you go basically two weeks without really getting any burn and then you just try to start it up again, if you're a young team, it's not easy to do that. And I think that's what we saw yesterday. You saw a guy, you know, they weren't playing like this was the last chance they were going to have to play the game this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nick Sirianni, what what jumped out to you from him this season from start to finish? How did he get better or worse as a uh, head coach and play caller? Uh, I think I think he got better as a play caller. I think. You know, early on, it was, you know, the first game of the year, we were all excited, and then he kind of had that lull. And I think he just started to realize, to me, um, a good coach is someone that looks at what they're doing well, what they're not doing well, and then continue to work on the things you got to get better at. And so I felt like throughout the season, this team actually got better. He got away from throwing the ball so much. He figured, hey, we can't throw it this much. We got to run the ball. So he stuck to that plan. And for the most part, throughout the season, he stuck to the game plan, um, created um, a niche of playing for, for Jalen Hurts and be, for him to be successful. And so for me personally, I, I thought it was a success for him. I thought he did well this year, um, given all this, the circumstances. What are your memories, uh, to, to shift away from the Eagles for a second here, what are your memories of Sean McDermott uh, taking over, you know, with the unfortunate passing of uh, Jim Johnson and the unfortunate uh, happenings surrounding his health? What What are your takeaways from playing for Sean McDermott in the brief time you did? To me, the, the biggest thing that um, I, I noticed and always respected about Sean was his dedication to the game. Um, you know, he he was very creative. He always came up with different type of blitz schemes, different um, ways to attack people, the way he coaches and breaks the game down, makes it to where, you know, someone that's a rookie or someone that's a vet was able to understand what he wanted and how he, um, you know, expected us to go out there. And so to me, like the biggest thing, man, his dedication, he used to sleep in the in the building, um, he was always talking football in the off season. He was like always kind of annoying me, trying to get me to go out there and do extra work. But it was it was good stuff. So you know, I think I think um, you know the, the success that he's having right now is strictly because of how hard he works and how how important the game is to him. Mm-hmm. D- did you see any of this in him when when he was here in Philadelphia? A guy that was going to go on to be a, a pretty already successful head coach there in Buffalo. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean. I have a really close history. I mean, he was the first the first uh, coach that I talked to, you know, during the draft process. I didn't get drafted, but, you know, towards the end of the draft, they'll start to call and get uh, free agents to come in. So Sean was the first person I talked to. And just going from, um, you know, kind of being under his wing as a, as a rookie and then the way he helped me develop and learn the game and, and stuff that I still teach some of my, my players that, you know, when I was coaching, I still teach those to this day. So, um, I, I knew early on that he had what it takes to become a head coach. You know, he's fiery, he's aggressive, he's smart. He has all the stuff that you need to 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 really become a successful coach. Do you see stuff in Buffalo that he does that you guys did here in Philly or had seen him do throughout his career? 
Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I watch the blitz schemes and I watch the defensive schemes and I see a lot of that. But I think one of the coolest things that I've seen from him, especially this year, is seeing how aggressive he is going forward on fourth down. I know that's a huge thing right now in the league, but um, I mean, that's something that he's always, um, you know, had had the mindset to do. And even though like he, he'd always just think about a little different things. Like I remember one time we were talking about, you know, hey, if it comes down to the end of the game, you know, what would you do? Would you play coverage or would you just go after him? And, you know, he broke it down and he's like in the situation, certain situations I was doing all out blitz to get the ball out of the quarterback's hands and make a tackle. And, and that back then I was like, I don't know if I would do that, but it started to make sense. I mean, you just, just little things like that. I mean, he's, he's always, um, show the, those, those things to me. So awesome. Sorry. Well, okay. he's no, no, it's fine. I get it. He's uh, he's done a hell of a job in Buffalo and I'll be honest with you, not revisiting this history, but when they were talking to Doug Peterson, talking to some other coaches, I was like, Sean McDermott, Sean McDermott. <laughs> A defensive minded yeah. head coach. Let's see it happen. And obviously they decided not to go that direction. Uh, Quinn, Michael, make sure you guys check out all the stuff with inside the birds, all the stuff they do on the inside the birds empire, as Jeff Mosher likes to refer to it. Q and a, the Q and a show with Quentin, Michael and Jason Devon. You want to hear a two time, uh, the second team, all pro you want to hear an all pro, uh, uh Quentin, Michael, listen to that podcast <laughs> and have yourself a good time. Uh, Q great catching up as per usual, my friend. Thanks so much for all the, the knowledge you have bestowed upon us throughout the NFL season. Thank you. No problem, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. The great Quentin Michael joining us on the Rothman Orthopedics guest line.